Uh, hi, I'm joined by uh, Tim Rodman. This is John Reed. Tim Rodman has been very active in the Acumatica community for a long time, including the Independent Acumatica Users Group, or AUG. Tim, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I forgot to ask you, are we recording video or just audio? <laughs> yeah, you know, we have the video going. We can decide at the end if we want to actually issue the video or not. But uh, no, it's fine. Man. I know. just make sure I won't pick my nose or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's let's keep it clean on video because I do have a YouTube channel, so we can always like go that route. Um, but yeah, um, you know, if if the bandwidth gets crappy, we'll shut down the video. But at the moment, we're we're rocking. Um, so I think the one of the big reasons I want to catch up with you is because. It seems like at the Acumatica Summit, you're like incredibly popular, so we don't usually connect. Um, but hey, that's the problem of being a, an active user group person. But um, in general, I just feel like the role of community in enterprise software is still a little bit underrated. And I just really wanted to hear more about the power of community from your perspective and just kind of what it's been like for you as, you know, with independent user group, um, Acumatica, Cloud ERP has has grown to a pretty sizable extent now with 10,000 plus customers. And so the importance of a user group starts to factor in, I think, in terms of providing customers another voice and another outlet. So maybe you could just share a little bit about how this all started, how you got involved, and and we'll take it from there. Yeah, so <laughs> I actually started uh, blogging about Acumatica when I was learning it back in 2013. And I mainly did it as a way to take notes because I can't find my own notes on my computer very well. So it's, it's easier for me to do a Google search and to, for it to be a Google search, it's gotta be public, right? So there you go. I started blogging and after a few years, it gets kind of lonely just producing blog articles. So I wanted a way to interact with people. And so I started some forums, online forums, and it's actually at augforums.com now. Originally it was just at timrodman.com, but Acumatica, told me that if I changed it to AUG forums, they would make it like their official user group site. Well, you know, as, as you know very well, you can never trust the promises of an ERP publisher, and mm -hmm. they, they didn't follow through on that. But I just kept the name, AUGforums.com. And so, yeah, I, I, uh, I do it as a way to learn. Um, people always have interesting questions, and uh, it kind of feels good to help someone with an issue, but then you also learn something yourself because you think about it from an angle that you never would have thought of before. How do you think this has evolved as far as the participation goes? Like, was it kind of a grassroots thing where people kind of shared the link and said, hey, this is another great alternative in terms of getting input? Was it mostly like, you know, help and support at first and then shifting into other things as well? Yeah, I think, you know, the help and support, I think it it's primarily been that. I think it's hard to mm -hmm. really have a consultative discussion, you know, in a in a forum. But yeah. um, so I think it's primarily been that. And it was the only option at the time. So it was definitely a grassroots thing. And when I started the forums, I didn't want it to just be me. So I created some some Muppet characters, Kermit the Frog, Miss Piggy and some others. And like would just sort of interact with myself just so I wasn't the only person. <laughs> and then, you know, other people joined. And then, you know, so that was the only option in terms of a forum out there for Acumatica. And a couple of years later, Acumatica then created their own. And, you know, of course, the traffic on their community.acumatica.com site is, is, is uh, way higher now than aogforums.com because they promote that to all their customers. Sure. And yet there's still kind of a role for, for your form. How do, how do you see that? Yeah, I tend to focus more on reporting. So I've noticed that mm -hmm. the posts that still come through on augforums.com are more reporting focused. Also, I have no contractual relationship with Acumatica. So, you know, if we want to complain about pricing of the product or something like that, that's a place you can do it without getting censored. Um, but you know, the traffic's definitely down, but it's, uh, it's not r as far down as I thought it would be. When I look at the stats, it's, uh, down a little bit. So I, I don't know what, exactly why that is, why people still post, but, um, yeah, it, it's still going. Yeah. It sounds like that the combination of having like more of a, 
open environment is is good. I think that's healthy. And then, like you said, reporting probably is, I would guess, is probably factoring in heavily just because, well, a couple things, right? I mean, there's, you know, we're, we're at a point now with enterprise software where, you know, getting better reporting and analytics and better making better decisions and things like that out, out of the software has become increasingly important. And then I think also in an Acumatica context, there's a lot of questions from customers around the best approaches to reporting and exploring third-party tools of various kinds. So I would think that you probably attract a fair amount of people with those questions. Yeah, I think reporting in general for any ERP system is probably one of the biggest reasons why people change systems, right? They can't get yep. the information they want. So it's always, I think, a popular topic and an important topic for for enterprise software. And do you feel you've uh, made some pretty good strides in terms of like helping um, Acumatica customers think about that? I know that you focus on it. So what, what have you kind of learned in terms of how to best approach this reporting topic? Yeah, good question. I think, uh, you know, it always comes down to, I think, two angles. One is understanding the tools that you have and understanding the third party tools that are out there. And then knowing when to apply which tool in what situation, right? Mm. Before you even get into the nitty gritty. Um, I know you've had uh, Johnny Girardi on before from Data Self. And I also like the way that he thinks about it, which is forget the technology altogether. And what's your pain? What are you really yeah. trying to achieve? What do you not have now that you want? And then work backwards into the technology or don't even think about the technology, right? Um, let, let a professional pick the right tool for the job. Um, so, and that's hard, I think, to do on a forum. But um, that's where I think the other side of user groups uh, comes down to being in person. And I have done some of that as well here in Columbus, Ohio. I call it AUG Ohio. And we've had a few in-person gatherings. Um, I could talk more about that if you like. But uh, yeah, that you know, that's kind of my reporting angle on the, the online part. Yeah. What happens when the, uh, when you get some people together in person, what, 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 what kind of chemistry, what, what kind of topics, how does that go? Yeah. So we're not huge, you know, we're like 10 to 15 people at this point, but some of the things I've noticed is, um, you know, first of all, to do it, I, I just say, you need two things. You need a place and you need food. I actually did our first gathering without food and learn real quickly, you need food. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's, those are two expenses. And I think it'd be really cool if any company has even like a warehouse, as long as it's heated, uh, to meet there, you know, like in the, the TV show, The Office, all the fun stuff happens out in the warehouse, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so I don't think it needs to be a fancy place, just a place to meet. And then, you know, someone pick up the tab on the food or even bring your own food, you know? Um, so as long as you get past those two hurdles, I think you you can meet. And my approach is um, I treat it kind of like an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting in that what, what we did is we just circled the chairs and gave everyone a couple minutes to go around and say what they're working on or challenges that they've had. So that's how we start. There's no presentation. We just went around and that really breaks the ice. And then we still had the room for a couple more hours. And it just mm -hmm. became side conversations. Uh, we did that the first few gatherings. I think we're kind of at the point now where we might have more some presentations, but I would really wanted it to be informal because for me, when I go to a gathering, I just sort of like, I have to sit through the PowerPoint, but really why I'm there is to talk to people afterwards. And so by going around the room, you get to hear from everyone and you kind of get an idea of who you want to talk to afterwards about whatever specific things they're facing. And then you've, you know, you've got the time for that while you're eating or whatever. And so you can't really do that online. And I think a lot of it comes down to trust. Um, you know, several times we've had someone just, we're talking about something and we're like, why don't you just plug in your laptop to the screen so we can all see it. Right. Mm. And people aren't hesitant to do that in a room of people. If you're online, there's just right. some sort of like, creepy, I don't know who's recording this. I don't really understand the technology, right? But in a room full of people, and they're the only ones who can see it, there's a level of trust there that you just can't do when you're online. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've tried to simulate some of that stuff online and, and it, it can work at times. And I think sometimes people underestimate the online part. But one thing I will say, having gone to like more events too, is like on the ground this last year or so is it also really makes the online stuff more vi more viable when you've met in person too. I think it's interesting to combine those two a little bit that that in person meeting really grounds those relationships. And then I think makes the online stuff better too, in my opinion. Um, what, what kinds of, um, topics like, like, um, when, I mean, obviously we talked about reporting, but when you put a bunch of Acumatica customers together in a room, what kinds of things come up? Yeah, I think because Acumatica is so horizontal and, you know, again, we're just 10 to 15 people in Ohio, but because it's so horizontal, like we've got one company that's more construction focused, another one that's uh, more distribution focused, another one that's more manufacturing focused, right? So your common ground is not uh, the industries. Your common ground is the the platform, and so something like reporting comes up, or or core features like business events in Acumatica that allow you to do notifications or dashboards, or just like we've also had conversations about just kind of Acumatica's cloud in general and like performance. Uh, who do you go to for troubleshooting different things? Um, those type of more core functionality, just because that's common ground across anyone who's using the product. Yeah, I really like this notion that 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 you can organize fellow users without like having to have some like organizational permission or some massive structure. That to your point, like you find a local sponsor you get people in a room and see what happens. And, you know, I used, I used to put on some smaller enterprise events. And one thing I was always struck by is when customers started talking to each other and started sharing stories. And I would just kind of stand back and kind of listen to a little bit. And sometimes I would say to a friend of mine, like that's thousands of dollars in consulting that they're saving right there, you know, like, and more because it's like, that's that perspective that they, that they're not necessarily getting, on their project, right? Those, those tips and tricks and different people to contact inside the vendor and, and different functionality. I mean, to me, like, I don't know if you feel the same way, but to me, that's like, that's gold. And I always wish like customers got to experience that more together. Oh yeah, I totally agree. And, and even to your point earlier, even if you don't get to that, you've built the trust now to take that online. Even if it's just in an email, it doesn't have to be Right. Yeah, any fancy video interaction, right? Uh, now I've got a relationship with someone that I can ask them about those more specific things, right? So yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you that it's like what you said, it's the perspective, right? I mean, consultants bring a needed perspective that customers don't have, but customers bring a perspective that consultants don't have, and both are, are very important. Yeah, and I think also you're going to manage your consulting relationships better if you if you have that perspective because like my biggest sort of thing I try to push customers on when I meet them at shows is like to you know to find a way to come up for air more and get more outside perspectives and it's not always easy to do right because you got project deadlines you got family lives you got all kinds of stuff going on but at the same time like y you want to be able to go to your team and say, Hey, there might be a better way of doing this, you know, like, you know, or should we ask our consulting firm about this, you know, cause you know, I think Acumatica has got a pretty healthy um, partner community overall, but that doesn't mean that there's not situations where it's good to be able to ask your partner a couple questions and say, Hey, you, you re looked into this approach yet. And so the more informed the customer is the, the better, I think that relationship's going to be versus just being totally dependent on outside person, you know? Yeah, and it, it is hard to do, I agree. And I think that's why I learned that food is important because it's not yeah. just a professional gathering. And exactly. I know for me, there's a, I don't know if everyone's this way, but I, I realize I have like this much capacity in my brain for work. And then there's this other part of my brain that has capacity for non-work. And the more you can yeah. put, I think, a user group into that non-work capacity, yeah. it's sort of like, no matter how much I eat, I always have room for ice cream. You know, there's there's like a different part for that. 
And it, it's the same with when, when you are just having a gathering and there's food there and it's not, you know, you're, you don't have a, a, an expected output from it, right? That things, things happen, right? That wouldn't even happen in a more professional gathering. So I think that's an important part. I think we've talked before about even just the element of fun, uh, how, whatever that looks like, that that's important to any type of community. It's not all productive. There's a, I would even use the word unproductive importance uh, to, to it, I think. It's really interesting you say that because I, I totally agree. And I think, I think about that a lot in my line of work as well. Cause like when I, when I do things like this, when I do like discussions like this, like I, I want them to be like informal and appealing enough to like listeners that, that I could imagine them listening to it on a weekend instead of maybe watching like some Netflix show, if they could push away from binge watching for a little bit, like, I don't want them to think about like, oh, this is like some, I don't want them to put this in like the webinar bracket, you know what I mean? Of like, oh, I, product information and stuff like that. Like, I want them to feel like, hey, I'm going to hang out with like, John and whoever he's talking with for like a half an hour. And I think the same is true for like, these kinds of in person gatherings, like the more it becomes a cultural experience, I think the more of a difference it makes in people's lives, I think it's a good approach to try to take as opposed to just like, uh, let's just have some dry product information. Cause I don't know, our brains can only absorb so much of that. And then we're just like, uh, push away. Yeah, totally. And, and when, you know, you've been on these webinars, right? The first questions that start to come through is, is this being recorded? And I think it's yeah. exactly because of that. You're like, you hit saturation real quickly. And then you're just like, uh, I don't want to make sure I have the recording to fall back on, you know, for yeah. the stuff I'm missing, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. So let's talk a little bit about about advocacy because I think you also have the opportunity to get into some advocacy on behalf of customers as a result of this because you have a, you know, not not just like speaking for collective voices, but just because you're hearing all this stuff, like now you can speak more confidently on the concerns of your peers. And I think that's really interesting because, you know, I think Acumatica is getting to the size where it's good for them to hear from user groups like yourself. And it's good to hear those independent voices. And so have you, have you thought a little bit about, about that? Because I mean, obviously providing peer support education, that's great, but then reflecting concerns back to Acumatica, have you thought about that part? Yeah, I, um, I have, I'd say, I'd say it this way, you know, I've been generating content about Acumatica for 10 years now, right? And, you know, you're, you're in this space too of generating content, right? Now you found a way to monetize it. I'm in this super small Acumatica <laughs> niche, right? Where I'm not like, this is not my full-time job generating content. And so I've kind of backed off the working for free for Acumatica angle. <laughs> and I've, you know, I've had, I've had many people contact me online and just assume that like, I'm, I'm an employee of Acumatica, right. Creating this content. And I've, I've realized, uh, you, you got to find a way to get paid as well. So when you talk about advocacy, um, you know, that's, that's to me more work where now you're going to try to figure out, yeah. all right, how do we get Acumatica to do something that we want? Right that's a lot of work because <laughs> then it gets political. It gets, uh, you know, you got to sit in meetings that become boring. Right. And so I'm really actually not that interested in doing any more to help Acumatica build their product. If there's something that I really don't like, I'll just complain about it. I'm more like a, uh, you know, someone on social media who will just like poke the the beast, you know, but any more than that then becomes work and mm. I'm not getting paid for it. So I, I, I don't, I don't really want to go down that path. <laughs> yeah. And it's probably helpful for listeners to know like the extent of what you're talking about. Like, cause I was on AUG forum the other day and you got some ungodly amount of posts that you've done, right? Like, it's 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 upwards of, is it four thousand plus? It's a lot of posts. I don't know, it's a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and so when you talk about that you put in some time, you you put in time and then of course you've done a lot of coverage too, like a lot of interviews, like during the pandemic, you were like 
Oh, for a couple of years there, you're like a one man content producer with all types of interviews and stuff. So I can see why you might start to ask yourself, like, how, how do I pace that, <laughs> you know, make sure I don't like burn myself out on that production line there, that content production line, which is a key lesson, right? Because community and content should facilitate your growth and development, but it shouldn't be pers- once it gets to the point where it's draining you, then I think you, you don't have the right set of trade-offs anymore. And I think that's where that separation between work and I don't know what the other word is, non-work uh, is mm-hmm. important because I, you can feel it happening, right? When it's fun, when it's interesting during the pandemic, when we were all locked down and we're craving interaction that it wasn't work to me, you know, doing, doing that kind of stuff. But, um, when it starts to become work, then you back off and find another way to make it fun. You know, I started blogging, then I did more forums and now I've been doing more of a podcast format just because that's been more energizing to me. Maybe energy is the key is finding where the energy is at for you and finding the area where you feel like you're growing. As soon as you stop growing and it becomes work, yeah, it's like, why am I doing this? Right. Um, Unless you're really going to turn it into a business model like you do, but that's that's a whole another ball game, right? You're not really talking community participation anymore. Uh, you're talking about a job, and so for anyone participating in community, I think that's an important part. You feel like you're you're growing your career, you're growing your network, you're growing something, and it doesn't feel like work. And as soon as it begins to feel like work, and that's another reason why I didn't take the presentation format with the AUG mm-hmm. Ohio group. Because as soon as you do that, you now have to line up presenters. You have, you know, a schedule to follow. And it just become. I've done that before, you know, with the Power BI user group I was a part of. And it became work really quickly. And so, yeah, I think that's an important consideration. The energy and and uh, whether you feel like you're growing or not. And if you feel like you're doing work versus that other part of your brain, whatever it's called, I think that's important. Yeah, and I'm I'm a big fan of radical event design for the enterprise and especially in smaller group settings. And I think a lot of times those presentation formats are really just a crutch because we're we're not confident enough in our ability to facilitate something more informal. And the bottom line is if you have a bunch of customers in the same room who've never met before, like you're really squandering your time if you're just having some canned presentation. Like you should be facilitating interaction for for that group of people and let them build relationships and share concerns. It, it's not hard. It just takes a little bit of guts to step away from like, because the fear is like, well, what if no one has anything to say to each other? And then we don't have anything planned and we're going to sit in a room, stare at each other for an hour. But the fact of the matter is that you, you, you won't because you have something in common. You have an investment that you've made together. And if you just allow it, it will come out. And, uh, of course you can certainly do things to seed those discussions and have a plan. So you don't feel like you're flying without a net, but I applaud your determination to move beyond that presentation format. Cause not only to your point, not only is it more work to prepare for in in that sense, but I think it's also a really stale format. So stale is a good word for it. I, I totally agree. Yeah. And we haven't had that problem in Ohio. Uh, I actually, I even use my, Oh, I don't have it here. I have my, uh, you know, my old school watch here and I put the oh, timer nice. on. I, I usually do two or three minutes. And, you know, when it, I just tell me when it beeps, it doesn't mean you have to stop. It's just because uh, some people talk longer. Some people don't talk that much. And that's that was structure that we had. And then the timer goes off and you're like, oh, I'll wrap it up. But we never had big gaps of silence. Everyone had something to say, right? Something they're struggling with or something cool they did that they wanted to share. And that's what we started with. There wasn't even a warm up, right? And so it was never an issue for us. Um, and I think you're right. I, I, I think the other, the bigger fear is the fear of like someone saying something bad about Acumatica, right? Or, mm. or the VAR's fear that the customer gets great advice from another VAR and they want to change VARs. I think that's the bigger fear and why I think it's important to have something independent because when you let Acumatica run it, then they have to field all those concerns, both from internal employees and from other VARs that that kind of stuff is going to happen. And so you then wind up with this, this uh, 
just marketing event, essentially. And I think that's that's the case for any publisher, right? You can only get that inner, that, uh, uh, what, I forget what the word you use, the, uh, I don't know, unscripted kind of interaction, I think, when it's truly an independent gathering. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I kind of take, I kind of straddle the fence in a way because I also encourage vendors to push the envelope a little bit and have more courage in terms of taking unvarnished feedback because in the end, unvarnished feedback is how you get better. Um, so I, I want vendors to push the envelope, but I, I do agree with you that like there there's there's also a real place for stuff that is not like connected to the vendor's commercial interest and that is run, you know, directly by either volunteers or users. And, you know, a lot of times the it's the volunteer user groups in enterprise software that, that tend to have the strongest voice uh, because they they aren't, you know, commercially tied in the same way. So I think that's important. And, you know, I think that's good for Acumatica to experience that. Now, you know, it, it'll probably be a bit of growing pains, I would predict, for Acumatica around that because they're not used to that. I mean, when, when SaaS companies start, they're so – they provide such a superior value proposition to the legacy software that comes before that they're used to kudos and handshakes and smiles. And, you know, um, so it, they're not used to getting that type of unvarnished feedback, but that's what we all have to do because – we all have to get better all the time, and no no vendor is above that. But it, it I think it's a culture change for organizations, especially when they're used to like. Because the fact of the matter is, yeah, they 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 do provide a superior solution, in my opinion, to a lot of legacy products that they replace. But that doesn't mean that there aren't problems and issues, and I've heard plenty of those too. And that's that's where I think you need to welcome that. But to your point, like I think there's a place where it's also good to say, look. We're going to have open conversations here and, and, and we get to do that because we're, we're independent. I love that. Yeah, I feel like with Acumatica specifically, they've done a great job historically of listening to that feedback. That's, I think, how they got to where they're at. It's really the yep. community paired with great technology. But I think you reach that certain that point and, you know, Acumatica's got a new CEO. There's definitely more of a corporate feel that I pick up even there at Summit. And there's just a fear, right, of losing what they've built. So you, you just sort of almost subconsciously start to r resist that unvarnished feedback, right? But I think a great place to look for a success story there is with Microsoft Excel. You know, we're talking about Microsoft, a publicly traded company. And if you look at how uh, chaotic the Excel community is, right, I mean, blogs all over the place. People will just say whatever, right? It's not scripted. It's, uh, and, and that's a big reason, I think, for the success of that little spreadsheet program. It's, it's just the fact that I can Google whatever I'm looking for and land on a post, right? So it's not controlled at all, I don't think. You know, they've even got their MVP program where they, like, really solicit that feedback back into Microsoft. And I think that's a great example of how you can be successful even at scale uh, with with listening to that kind of feedback and not trying to control the conversations like a lot of ERP publishers get into. Yeah, well, I think those are good lessons and hopefully that'll be something that Acumatica can, can take to heart uh, because I think you're absolutely right. And there is definitely such a thing as, as, as growing to a point where things do feel more corporate in, in companies. And some of that can be healthy as far as certain processes that they need to be in place. But to your point, I think there, there should always be a little bit of an appetite for those underground conversations and that, that culture that got you to that point. And you never want to lose that for sure. And so, you know, I think smaller groups like yourself and, and even some of the, like, I've seen, I've seen a few of your, your outspoken LinkedIn posts as well. And I think, that's good. Community should have stuff like that. And, you know, I, I hope that, that Acumatica will continue to be one of those vendors that says, hey, when I see something like that, I'm going to make a note of it and I'm going to come back in a year and say, hey, have we gotten any better? I remember uh, one time I had a dealing with a vendor executive that I really was impressed with. He worked for a large vendor that's not associated with transparency, so I'm not going to name the vendor, but the thing I really liked about him is not that associated every, with transparency. I like that line. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing I really liked about him is that 
we were working on some concerns around developer advocacy and, and free access to developer tools. And every year he would come back and say, have we got it right yet? And I, I love that. And then he'd open it up and we'd be like, mm, you're 70% there. <laughs> and you still got to do this, this, and this. So he'd go away, come back six months or a year. Have we got it right yet? I love that. I mean, that's, isn't that the whole point, right? Like, like, so, so if you suppress and ignore and disregard the, the open commentary, then you lose the chance to improve. No, that's a great point. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, there's benefits that come along with the corporate. I mean, even just Acumatica surpassing that 10,000 customer mark, uh, to me, it's, it's an indication of they're not under the radar anymore. And now you, there is a lot of benefit to that, right? Um, and so, yeah, how to maintain that appetite and that curiosity and that that listening, right? Even if you can't fix it, at least you're listening, right? Yeah. I think so far they've done that. And it's not easy to do because the, the bigger the thing grows, the more people involved. It's, it's, uh, it requires a, a continual effort, I think, to keep that going. But it's important. So I want to come to close pretty soon, but I think one of the things I'd really like to to help get across, because you you kind of talked a little bit about about hitting the wall in terms of like doing too much, but but I also really want to get across like the power of what you have done as far as like that that you've approached the the aspect of being part of the Acumatica community with a lot of creativity. Like you've kind of said, hey, what what can I do? And you created some stuff. You created content, you created a uh, forums and, you know, I would just sort of like to close with just a couple of comments for listeners who are kind of, who may be customers or may have ideas like this. This is possible, right? I mean, this is the social media age. There's all kinds of places you can build out a little form or group or kind of put your toes in the water here. So give us a little motivational speech on like, on the value of doing that. Like why you should do it. Yeah. Um, I think try to can... try to hide your burnout and give give us some motivation here. <laughs> well, yeah, I wouldn't say I'm burned out. I, I'm just, uh, I, yeah, I wouldn't say I'm burned out. I just, I, uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm just, I, I'm always looking for a, a, a something new, right? Something where you're growing. So, yeah, why why to do it? I think if you compare it to something that is a true business pain point, you know, I'm struggling with something in the software and I don't have a great solution. You, you have now something at work that is a need, right? And then you go to the non-work part of your brain and you create something that's going to help address that need, but in an indirect way. So that's how you keep it separate and you keep the energy going, right? So mm -hmm. do whatever, like we're, you know, we're recording this on StreamYard. StreamYard, you can go do a live broadcast on a yep. topic, right? Um, uh, you could write a blog post and publish it on LinkedIn. So you don't even need a platform. You could, I started on wordpress.com. You can create a free website on wordpress.com. Um, then I eventually, you know, bought my own URL and got a hosting thing, but you don't have to do that. You could fire up a website and do a blog post or do a guest blog post on a site like Diginomica or, even on Acumatica's blog or someone else's blog, but you're getting your need out there. You have some fun creating it and it maybe indirectly comes back and meets a need at work. So it's, it's sort of like a circle, right? You, you, you worked mm. on it in the non-work part of your brain, but then it comes back and benefits your company. And then maybe you repeat the cycle with another issue that you have. Yeah. And I think a big part of that is that you're not too inexperienced or or novice to do it. Like, even if you haven't worked it all out, like you said, like maybe you haven't figured out all of Acumatic reporting yet, but you still have an important topic or question or something you're working on. Putting oh, it out there. Yeah. Put, Actually, putting it out there is a great way to get better and smarter. I, the, what I've learned in this process is the newer you are, you're in a better position because the more you know it, you skip over stuff that someone who's new to it uh, is thinking about right so i actually think when you're when you're writing about something you're better off if you're new to the topic because you're going to articulate it in a way that's easier for someone to understand because you're not going to make any assumptions yeah I, I i think that's a great point 
And then I think the other really interesting lesson that that you sort of alluded to in our discussion that I want to end on is I, I was kidding with you about taking on too much or whatever, but what you did do, I think was over time you made course corrections based on like the energy you were putting in versus what you're getting back. And you also has seems like you've gravitated to different uh, formats and approaches. Right. And so like if, if right now podcasting is bringing you the best sort of trade off between time and, and what you get back, then that's, your focus, right? So there's no one right way to do this, right? You kind of figure it out. Sounds like you kind of figured out the best way to sustain it based on your interests. And knowing that it'll change in the future. Yeah. And yeah. I, I forget exactly how you said it, but I, I think exactly in terms of net energy output, whatever you put in, there yep. needs to be more that you're getting out of it. And as long as that's the case, it's sustainable. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for sharing that. I've been wanting to hear more about how this all started for kind of a long time. So it was cool to to get that. And I'm sure some other listeners are going to enjoy hearing how, how you created your own user group. That's pretty cool. Well, yeah. Thanks for having me on. I enjoyed the chat. Absolutely. Thanks, Tim. I'll see you at the next Acumatica gig at some point here. <laughs>